This is Drupal at uchicago.edu. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk about what we're doing at uChicago um, in Drupal uh, and how hopefully it can apply to you somewhere. Uh, I did this presentation originally last year at Drupal Camp Chicago. Was anybody there? One of you? It's a lot of the same. I'll try and do some new stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah, and there were also three of us that put this together originally. Uh, I'm going to be talking for two other guys. Uh, so excuse me if there's some pieces that, uh, that I don't fully you flesh out. Can close the door? So sure. Can, so can um, sure I can do it. Yeah, can one of you guys? I'm so up yeah, David's got it. Yeah. All right. Uh, cool. So uh, how many of you guys are in education? Education, higher ed, or primary, secondary, a couple of you. Awesome. What do the rest of you guys do? Stuff? What do we do? Where do you, like? I was a former dean at Northwestern. Okay, cool. Uh, okay. I'm working at web development. Sure. What? Okay. Development? No. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out the my, my audience. Um, I've got some stuff in here for site builders, some kind of back-end stuff. Uh, it's all over the place. Um, I'm going to go kind of quickly so we have time for demo and questions at the end. Um, this is over at 1, 2, 3. All right. Um, feel free to yell. Stop me if uh, you have any questions. Um, I'm totally open to being interrupted. So uh, this is me. This was my first Drupal event. Do it Drupal in New Orleans in 2008. That's me in the corner. For reference, that's uh, Scruffy Eaton, um, our, our illustrious speaker, and lots of the lullabots in uh, five years ago. But anyway, uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is sites.uchicago.edu. This is a, uh, a, a templating system that uh, we've developed at the university um, to help our people uh, manage their content. Um, so, uh, you know, the reason we did this, um, like I assume the rest of you, five, ten years ago, a lot of people were had static sites and said, this is dumb, I want to do something different. Um, but everybody wants XCMS and nobody wants to pay for it, especially on campus. We've got departments and divisions and offices and admin assistants and professors that all want their own sites. Um, so we had to come up with, uh, with some way of saying yes to them. Um, not you know, making it a free option and making something that uh, that's scalable and, and works for everybody from you know a huge department to a faculty member that uh, that wants um, wants to have a couple basic pages. Uh, and again, this this whole thing is supported by one maybe two people, uh, so it had to be pretty uh, easily supported. So uh, about a year ago, we, uh, they started working on it, two years ago now. Um, and we had already been doing a little bit of Drupal on campus. Drupal was open source. We had a lot of people that knew about it. Um, and so we started looking at other uh, Drupal-based solutions, domain access, open scholar, organic groups. Uh, found these are all interesting solutions to very specific problems. Um, and a lot of them are pretty hard to abstract to exactly what we wanted to do. So um, came up with uh, our own solution, because that's what you do. Um, they call it Templatron. Uh, so it's one multi-site install of Drupal um, with some minimal custom code, uh, a bunch of contrib modules, and um, basically every site is just a clone of a base site. It's a, you know, a drush command and a, you know, a database clone of this uh, this base site, um, and you have a new site. Um, so everything shared in sites all modules, which has pluses and minuses. But uh, it's one core. Uh, it's relatively minimal, uh, and it works really well. We've got uh, over 200 live sites uh, after two years. There are probably about 300 sites total running on the single core. Um, they batch process new site requests um, four to five weeks. So it's a, it's a pretty huge thing. And it's come over really, really well on campus. Um, 
So a lot of it's feature driven. Have you, all you guys used features? Yes. Yeah. Uh, features is awesome. It lets you build stuff in the in the uh, UI, export it out to code, and then dump it into any site that you want as a you know pre built module. Uh, it's really great. Uh, you can build out views. Uh, Strongarm is a module that pushes variables over. Uh, there's WYSIWYG editor stuff, text formats. Um, and again, you just take this feature that, uh, that's built by the features module, dump it into sites all modules, and then you can run a drush command to enable it on every site. Uh, that uh, takes us to drush. Um, has anybody not used drush? Okay. If you have at all the possibility of having shell access to your server, or your dev site, or whatever, you need to run Drush. Um, installing modules is Drush DL module, Drush EN module, instead of going and finding it, and downloading it, and unzipping it, uh, whatever. Um, it's amazing. It has huge, huge functionality. Um, uh, when you get pro at it, you can do site installs, clones, like moving from dev to prod, um, all on the command line. It's, it's insane. Um, even, even if you're not a huge coder, there's still a lot of useful stuff you can do with it. Uh, so again, we, we use this to roll out new features, basically package it up, run one Drush command, and it uh, installs it on all the sites. Uh, and general maintenance, you can clear caches with Drush. Um, you can do all this stuff, so it lets you script um, really easy uh, ways to, to you know, maintain a huge multi-site instance. Uh, and then the, the last thing that kind of makes this whole thing work is, uh, is simplic simplicity and consistency. So um, in talking to all of the people on campus, what, you know, what we found is that people want to just make a website. Um, they don't need huge complex works, work, workflows. Um, they don't need really complex content types. They want to put some pages up, and they don't want to have to work to do it. Um, so, you know, it works. There's a basic, uh, you know, um, support request system, uh, and, uh, and there's very, very little customization between sites. Um, again, there are over 200 sites, and uh, almost all of them are exactly the same, and almost all of them serve their purpose for the users, which is, uh, is pretty huge. Um, Howard, yeah? Could you go back to number one for a second? Mm -hmm. That's just, no, YouTube. So yeah, there we go. Okay. So is this this is part of Drupal or is this part of Flush? Features is a module, as a Drupal module. Um, so you turn it on and basically it gives you an interface and uh, once you build out something, so say you've got a, a news content type, um, you can go into features and say, I want to take this news thing. So the content type, maybe an image style, maybe a view that's associated with it, and it does all the work bundling that into a module. Um, I didn't need to, I'm, I'm about to rank again. No, 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 totally. Uh, like I said, this this presentation kind of spans the gamut, so feel free. Um, yeah. Uh, who's yeah? Who's who's like super beginner? Who's like uh, I've installed modules and run a bunch of sites, but mostly in the UI, who like does coding hardcore. Okay, so we've got, we're not too advanced. Uh, we've got a bunch of beginners here. Uh, I'll go through the... Uh, <laughs> I try. Um, I was there for a long time. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a hardcore coder. I do a lot of work in the UI and do code when I need to. Um, so that's kind of where I come from. Um, so again, uh, it's a lot of work to maintain 200 plus sites. Uh, stuff like cache clears take an hour or something. Uh, it's it's crazy, but uh, you know it works. Uh, and again, there's it, it is one kind of single point of failure. It's been pretty solid for two years. Um, and features uh, can screw, screw stuff up sometimes. Uh, just happens. You gotta learn how to cope with it. Uh, a couple other modules that, uh, that we've been using here. LDAP um, is huge. It helps us immensely. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, some stuff with roles, delegation, uh, and strong arm, like I said, 
allows you to take Drupal variables and export them so you can recreate the same setup in other sites. Um, that, that kind of mix of features in Strongarm uh, is, is a really, really powerful set of mostly UI tools that you can use to, to really easily move content between sites. Um, uh, not necessarily content, actually. Uh, content, configuration, everything. Um, so if you, if you do, I mean, a lot of the time you're just doing one-off sites, um, but I mean, we have some standard setup that, you know, we've got uh, LDAP configuration, we've got WYSIWYG configuration, you know, if you're doing more than one site ever, you probably have things that you want to have the same um, that aren't built into core. So features in Strongarm can be really helpful in uh, just packaging those up so you don't have to click through the same, you know, dozen screens every time you set up a new site. Um, so uh, any other questions on the site stuff? Once I get through the slides, I'm going to demo it. Uh, so. There. Yeah. As a business question. Sure. So the Drupal 8 is going to have configurations built into the core, which won't have the need for features mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah. Does UIC near U Chicago. U Chicago. The other university in Chicago. <laughs> uh, is there a migration plan? Uh, not that I know of yet. Okay. Um, this is it's not my group that that manages this whole thing. Um, I know there's a plan, you know, to have a plan, okay. to make a plan. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it is. Uh, it would definitely be useful. Um, in general, what I've seen is um, most of the groups around campus follow the every other um, upgrade path that has kind of was set out before. Drupal 8 may make that not necessary. And it, I mean, I know I have a lot of Drupal 6 sites, and updating them to 7 is, is not trivial if there's a lot of custom code. Um, so kind of when I started, the, the party line was, you know, you have two cores going. You have a 6 and a 7, or you have a 5 and a 6, or you have a 7 and 8. Um, and you kind of update sites from like 6 to 7 to 8, or from, yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, Drupal 8 will be the goal. You can almost go start new sites on eight and then as all the old sites fade out, which is right. another question is how often do the sites fade out or are they asking for them for a certain project or yeah. is it usually a longer term that they look for them to set it up for? Um both. I mean they're like I said, there are departments that have sites. Uh, they're never going away. But uh, there have been some I mean I set one up for uh, it was a grant proposal that they put out that I don't think they got the grant. So, but they had to have a website to submit the grant proposal. So it was there for like six months, and then they didn't need it anymore. And, and just they they go through and kind of review uh, sites that haven't been touched in a while. And um, it's it's mostly a manual process of reaching out to people, saying, "Hey, are you using this? Is it okay to delete it?" Um, but again, it's it's a single core, um, and you know, it's uh, we we do have a pretty significant infrastructure. Um, to do load balancing and um, the, the SQL uh, infrastructure is pretty solid. So it's not really that resource intensive um, to have you know, 250 um, SQL uh, databases and uh, that kind of stuff. Cool. Uh, and I'll show this off a little bit later. It's, it's really fun. Um, all right, so authentication. Um, this is another thing that's huge. Um, we're at a university. We have a ton of infrastructure already in place, and we want to leverage that for Drupal. Uh, we have 30,000 users at UChicago, 30,000 active users at any one time in our LDAP database. Um, we don't need to recreate those user accounts in every single site, because then we'd have more than 30,000 user accounts to account for. People have their passwords set up. Um, it's all centrally managed, and uh, it just works. So we didn't want to. Part of Five years ago, when I started evaluating uh, content management <coughs> systems, part of that was what can work with our current systems. Um, this was the other thing that uh, that I, I found. Uh, this is the the University of Chicago uh, Identity Management Functional Architecture Diagram from 2012. This is all of the systems that that make up our infrastructure, our identity infrastructure. 
it's, it's insane. Um, it's completely insane. Uh, so I didn't want to have to see that ever again. All I needed was that. Um, and so I figured it out. Uh, so the most important thing that I can tell you if you ever have to deal with authentication stuff is find the person that made it and get documentation from them, whether it's whether they have it already or they need to make it. You need to tell them, if you're doing this, you need to do it well, write documentation. Um, our, luckily, our LDAP, uh, as you saw that, uh, we have uh, a web page that's publicly accessible that has every LDAP attribute that we can access, um, as well as how to bind and all of this stuff. It's really amazing. Uh, I would bet that almost nobody else has that, because um, it's really hard. But uh, talk to the, per the, the person in charge and get them to at least help you with that. Uh, that's, uh, in a lot of cases, the only way you're going to figure out how to do authentication stuff. Um, so once you know how to connect to your authentication systems, um, there's LDAP, which, uh, which I said is, is pretty standard among a lot of education institutions. Um, there's various single sign-on methodologies. Shibboleth is, uh, is what the one that we use. It's pretty well supported in the in Common Federation, which is a, a big organization of uh, higher ed institutions. Um, there's, uh, there's another one that's big. Uh, so there's also group management stuff. We have, as you may guess, in the 30,000 users, there are a lot of different ways that the university categorizes people. Uh, we wanted to leverage that as well. So there's uh, this system called Grouper. Uh, again, it's it's uh, managed by the kind of Internet Two group and the Incommon uh, Federation. It's a uh, it's a UI that we'll talk about in a sec. So, um, just a little bit on LDAP. Uh, there are two different projects for Drupal Six and Drupal, Drupal Seven, but basically the LDAP module kind of sits um, between the local LDAP services and the kind of user stuff in Drupal. Um, so it, it provides you know a basic level of uh, of authentication uh, of uh, you know server connections uh, authentication and then uh, a couple different modules to do authorization either to roles or organic group stuff uh, and then it can do queries for feeds for views uh, it can also feed into the user um, data so there's a ton of stuff packaged into this uh, this module that. Uh, lets you do things really well. So yeah, as I said before, um, this, is, this is our kind of page of every single LDAP attribute, what it is, uh, you know, an example of the data you might get, and kind of how it's used in our ecosystem. Um, if you don't have this, uh, try and find it. It's, it's really useful. Um, the LDAP module in Drupal, once you get it set up, uh, there's also a page where you can go in and uh, get a uh, get a DSM output of every single attribute you're getting uh, from an LDAP user. That's really useful to kind of see what's going on. I'll try and uh, demo that. So um, yeah, once you get LDAP installed, figure out your server, um, how to connect and bind to it, um, then uh, yeah, there, there are some settings you can have. Uh, one, of the, one of the things you may find initially is that um, you're now allowing 30,000 users to authenticate to your site. Um, so uh, if, if you, know, you don't change the settings. So uh, you can probably assume that most of the people in your institution aren't going to like log in and you know, try and spam people. Um, but you never know. So. Uh, it's always good to check that authenticated, authenticated user kind of list of permissions and see what's in there. Uh, another powerful thing that you can do um, is, uh, is assign attributes, uh, assign roles or organic groups based on stuff in, uh, in LDAP. So um, one of the features uh, in the LDAP authentication is this uh, mapping of LDAP groups to Drupal roles. So I've got a couple of groups that come through to LDAP, and I can say, all right, um, you know, I have a group that's everybody on my staff 
uh, and all of our student employees. Um, so that's not that many people. There are like five people in our office, and we have a couple students at a time. But uh, I can say on every, L on, on, on every Drupal site that I have, make all of our staff administrators and make all of our students content editors. So that's pretty huge so that I don't have to manage the, uh, the, the users for every site. We've, my office has 20 to 30 sites at any one time that we manage. Um, so not having to kind of add new people to every single one is, is really nice. Uh, you can also do some basic stuff um, in the user profiles. So I wrote a little feature that assigns the LDAP attribute for the first name and last name to first name and last name fields in the user profile. So now on every site that I have, when a person logs in, it has their first name and last name. Uh, and I use the real name module. Has anybody used that? Real name is a module that basically takes two fields and concatenates them together so that you can have a first name and last name for a person and it shows as their full name. It's pretty straightforward, but it's really powerful. Um, so you can do that for anything. If you have, you know, um, uh, course of study, titles, phone numbers. Uh, if you have uh, an LDAP system set up well, you can pull a ton of stuff from that uh, and you can leverage all that in Drupal. So again, like I said, uh, there's a, a test URL. Um, you can put in any ID that's in your LDAP database and get Drupal to ping it and see what comes back. Uh, that's really useful, again, if you don't have all of this well-documented data you can see what's, uh, what you can get through Drupal. Uh, so there's uh, LDAP for D7 is still in the process of being documented. Uh, this is the URL for it. Uh, go there and help out if you're interested in LDAP. Uh, Shibboleth is another thing. Has anybody heard of Shibboleth? A couple of you guys? Okay, good. Who uses it? Who uses it with Drupal? Awesome. Uh, so SHIB is a, is a single sign-on methodology. Uh, it's really nice. Um, you can do single sign-on across all sorts of different sites, uh, whether it's Drupal or custom PHP or an HTML site, if you really wanted to. The difference with SHIB is that uh, it passes all of the attributes by SSL, which is nice. Uh, LDAP may or may not do that. Uh, and it tosses it into PHP variables. So um, you can do even more stuff uh, with those attributes uh, if you want to. It also allows federating between accounts, uh, between single sign-on accounts and uh, existing Drupal accounts. So um, you can, uh, if, if a person already has an account, you can create an account in Drupal and kind of have it automatically link up to the single sign-on account it's pretty nice. SHIB also uh, has a lot of stuff built in for um, federation across institutions. Um, so uh, there's a, a big push from the kind of Internet2 group, uh, IV+, a bunch of these different uh, kind of higher ed organizational groups um, to do federated, federated logins. So with Shibboleth, I could give somebody at Northwestern or somebody you know, any, any of hundreds of institutions around the world access to our Drupal sites um, to, to be able to log in with their local credentials. Uh, that's huge if you're doing any kind of work uh, across institutions. Um, you, can, you can allow, you know, anybody in this federation to, to authenticate without a new password, which is always the goal. Every password that somebody creates is a new, you know, vulnerability somewhere. Uh, so I, uh, I updated this slide a little bit. Uh, I, some positives and, and, and negatives. Um, Shibboleth used to be really hard, uh, and it used to take a lot of work. Uh, the, the guys who run it, the Incommon Federation, has done a lot of work documenting this whole process. Uh, they have a whole set of training seminars. Um, they're doing in-person, and uh, they've got full documentation for them. Um, if you are doing anything with Shibboleth, write this down, just bit.ly slash shibdrupal. Um, Incommon has, it's, it's, it's documentation to the letter 
on how to set up a service provider from you know um, Apache all the way up to Drupal. Uh, it's almost everything you need to, to run SHIB from nothing, and, uh, and it's, it's really, really good documentation. So, uh, so that's worth checking out. We, I did a little seminar, and in a day, uh, everybody in the room had a SHIB uh, service provider running on their machine. So it was, uh, it was pretty huge. So like I said, uh, SSO is great for users. You, know, you don't want to put in your password more than you have to. Uh, it's more secure than LDAP because it's all uh, SSL by default. And again, the documentation is huge. Uh, just a screenshot. Uh, this is PHP info um, with all of my stuff coming in. So you can see it just writes these variables into uh, you know these global variables into PHP. So you can call them you know with custom PHP anywhere you want. Um, this is a list of all of my memberships. Um, so you can see there are tons of things in there. Um, yeah. Last thing on this, uh, Grouper is a really neat tool, again, by Internet2. Um, it, it's kind of the um, user group management system that, uh, that's been developed. Uh, so it's a really, it's not a great UI, but it's, it's, it's a way of managing user groups outside of Drupal. Um, so it lets, uh, it lets people kind of create these user groups, manage them, aggregate them in all kinds of crazy different ways, and then feed it out to LDAP or Shiv or Active Directory or whatever you want to do. Uh, it's, you know, it takes some setup and you probably have to get your kind of high level uh, server guys to, to integrate it into your ecosystem, but uh, it's really neat once you get it up and running. Uh, I can create a group in there those groups that you saw before, I created in, in uh, Grouper, and then they feed out to LDAP, which feeds into Drupal, but it can also be used by a custom PHP site, WordPress, whatever. Um, so, so you can kind of have a higher level of, of user group aggregation. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go through this, but basically, um, this is kind of, if you're having trouble figuring out how this works, um, yeah, we've got uh, we've got a custom PHP site that uh, a, an external group wrote for us. Um, they do really good custom PHP, but not the best kind of content management system stuff. So we wanted to allow our content managers to have some way of serving content to the folks using the site. Um, so we've got a, a custom PHP site that writes some stuff to Grouper and then feeds into the Drupal site. Um, so the custom PHP site assigns these folks, uh, these groups in Grouper. So I use the shibboleth module to basically say, if this attribute contains this role, then assign, or this string, then assign a role to it in Drupal. Um, what I can do from there is say, um, if a user has this role, this is the uh, login destination module. I can say, if a user has this role, then as soon as they log in, send them to this page. So now everybody, this is, these are orientation kind of aids um, that apply for a thing in the custom site and then come to the Drupal site for information about what's going on. Um, so each of them logs into the site. When they log in, they're directed to a specific page uh, with content related to what they're doing. And then, uh, yeah, so, so if a, a student hired as an orientation leader may see this saying, here's your information about orientation leaders, um, you know, somebody who's a different role, different uh, status may sign in and see something totally different. So. Mm -hmm. Your uh, content management system is just a uh, Radius is, is mostly just a hardware thing. I'm not totally sure. I, know, I think they use it for like authentication on Wi-Fi access points and stuff. I'm just saying, like, you use it for like, speaking devices or limiting the internet or anything like that? Mm, not really. Not that I know of. I, like I said, I try and touch that as little as possible. Uh, okay. Uh, I've got about 10 minutes left. 
I'm going to run through. This is uh, this is kind of a case study on the humanities division. Um, just a little bit about what they're doing. Um, they, you know, they have a ton of people that they support uh, that they all need to do web work for um, various events, magazines, databases. Um, you know, everything from uh, like humanities day event where they've got you know a thousand people coming to campus to uh, like huge databases of images of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, so they, uh, they kind of, you know, went through the same thing that, that a lot of us did um, at some point when we started using Drupal, said, you know, okay, what, what do I have in terms of cost slash time versus power and flexibility? So um, they're, you know, You've got static HTML and in-house kind of custom stuff over here that is, you know, custom stuff is pretty powerful, but it takes a lot of time. Um, you know, some basic stuff over here, and then multi-site, custom multi-sites where they can, you know, you can do whatever you want, use some custom code, uh, which again is has been the solution for all of us that want to do really specific things. Um, they've got around 30 to 60 sites. Um, Again, you know, trying to bring the content to the content owners, um, but they're integrating with other sites, databases. Uh, they use uh, Solar Search. Um, you know, they've got conference registration and surveys and stuff that they need to be secured, uh, and they, of course, want it to be fast. Um, so, multi-site Drupal, everybody's doing it. Um, a lot of these things are pieces that I've talked about. Solar, uh, all of the LDAP and SHIB authentication. Uh, they build out their entire uh, separate infrastructure for hosting, so they're doing all the hosting on uh, VMs, uh, their own hardware that's load balanced. Uh, uh, this is kind of how it works. Uh, they've got a, a dev stave stage machine that uh, is, is pretty much the exact same setup as production. Uh, they've got two um, Drupal 7 cores, and then one for V6, kind of like I was saying before. Um, almost everybody that I know is running both six and seven sites together uh, at this point. So it's, it's good to have that there. Uh, LDAP, contrib modules, custom modules, um, and everybody's site's different. So this is, you know, instead of, uh, instead of going the way sites is, where everything's exactly the same, and the content editor is, you know, can really just generate content. Uh, these guys have two or three developers that uh, that are working and doing customized stuff for every site. Uh, but again, it's all one multi-site, just a couple for development and production. Uh, so it's it's a lot less, you know, it, it's not a huge deal to maintain. Um, again, Drush everywhere. Uh, it's uh, yeah. Using external authentication means we don't have to deal with users ever, uh, which is great. If the user forgets their password, Drupal doesn't have anything to do with it, which is easier for the user. Um, keeping things simple is uh, is the way to do. You know, we uh, everybody on campus kind of works with the Drupal community. Uh, we also have a, a user group on campus. Um, they've got some automated monitoring stuff that's fun too. That's, uh, so uh, this is some more kind of detail about their, uh, their setup. Um, it's uh, load balanced servers with SSL, uh, Apache on solar for the backend search, um, redundant everything. Uh, APC is a big, uh, a big deal uh, for caching PHP stuff. Um, Memcache and Varnish. Um, Varnish, if you haven't used it, is huge. Um, most of what we do uh, around campus is uh, anonymous access sites. So it's sites where somebody just comes and wants to get data. Um, a lot of that, you know, they're not logging in. They don't need custom stuff. They really just want to see what's on the site. Um, what Varnish does, if you uh, if you aren't familiar, uh, it you know, if you're running a, a content-based site, it caches everything to to HTML uh, in front of Apache so that you know, if a site ha hasn't changed in a week or a month, uh, you know, if the front page hasn't changed, 
there's no reason to, for Drupal to serve it. You just serve an, a cached HTML version of it uh, in front of Drupal. You don't have to do any database hits. You don't have to do anything. Um, it's really nice. It speeds up sites uh, vastly. I mean, we've seen like um, five to 10x kind of speed increases just by putting varnish in front of uh, Drupal sites. So for, and it's only for unauthenticated access, but when 99% of your users are doing that, that's all I need. Um, so, okay, any questions on that stuff before I go to the demos? That's a little higher level server stuff. Um, I'm gonna show you this, uh, you Chicago sites. So this is the, uh, this is the front end of, uh, of the you Chicago sites. Thing. Uh, so this is what we can spin up in you know a, a few minutes for uh, for anybody who requests a site. Uh, like I said, it can be a single faculty member or a whole department. Um, it's got a nice homepage with some you know a, a little rotating feature. Um, it's got menus. It's got social media. Um, <coughs> There are a couple different blocks. There's a, uh, yeah, uh, integration with our events management system. Um, and then kind of some basic pieces of content. There's a page, which is a page. Um, news article, which is a page with a date attached to it. Uh, an image gallery. And then there are also these directories, which is a newish feature that uh, that we put in. So you can you know have little pieces of content that uh, that correspond to people, and then have a nice display uh, to to put that out. So I'm going to log in here and just show you a little bit of the back end. No, it's uh, it's all kind of user generated. Um, we've found that. I mean, everybody's picky about what they want shown. Um, so it could be through LDAP. I've, I've done some custom directories through LDAP before, but you never know what's coming through, and somebody might want their you know, a different name or a maiden name, or the title in LDAP isn't exactly, doesn't have every piece of you know, some professor's full title in there. So it's it's pretty tough. Um, sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's that's one of the primary reasons that uh, that this happened. Um, you know, before this, people had everything everywhere. Um, you know, departments would hire undergrads to make a site for them and. The undergrads didn't know any better. They would go pull some random things down, spin up a WordPress site, uh, put some colors on it. Hey, like maroon, well, there might be a lot of different shades of maroon, or they don't know where the logos are. Uh, yeah, so this is a huge way to, to enforce branding. Um, they've, I've, uh, we've, we've kind of worked on a few different templates for it. Uh, so there are a couple different options for people, and uh, some divisions can put their own branding on it. Uh, if, if they're you know developers that have worked on that, uh, but in general, every I would say probably ninety percent of the two hundred sites on here look exactly like this, um, which is a, a huge huge step. Um, but so now uh, a user can go in and say you know use the contextual menus and say I want to edit this homepage feature. It's Drupal, but uh, it's a, it's a huge step beyond uh, what's existed. Uh, for people before, so you know this is the uh, a basic uh, kind of note edit page, but this is something that you can teach, uh, you know, an admin assistant that is not really comfortable with Word how to use in an hour or two. Um, you know, it's uh, there's title blurb, there's a link, you can upload an image. Um, there's you know we've got description fields that document everything in line. So it's it's pretty straightforward. Um, I'll go ahead and edit this one. Hmm. 
You guys have all seen the video, right? About the fox. Yeah, he's seen it. Uh, yeah, so so you can go in there and, and edit this, and it shows up right in this uh, in this page. Um, again, they're they're links. They're they're all of these kind of pre-configured blocks, um, but it's uh, it's set up in a way that uh, that most users can go in and edit. Um, if you haven't seen uh, one of the cool features of uh, CK Editor, there's this uh, um, block display. Uh, you can turn this on in the settings by default, um, but it wraps every paragraph and div and header in a little box that says P or H3, whatever. Um, it's really, really nice way of uh, showing non-technical users what's going on. So just kind of abstracting blocks and divs, or not blocks, but uh, paragraphs and divs and headers to people that have no idea what HTML is. Um, you can just say, you know, if, if you've got text, if your text is in a box like this, then it's okay. If it's not in a box, then something's wrong, and you might want to fix it. Um, exactly, yep. This is CK Editor. CK, huh. CK editor is a is a, a another open source is a open source WYSIWYG editor. Uh, oh, uh, this is this is all these are all settings in CK editor. CK editor. Uh, the the blocks thing is uh, it's some setting called like uh, show blocks. I think it's is is what it is. Um, there's another thing. Uh, you if you just enable CK editor by default. Uh, you just get regular default page styling, um, but CK Editor comes with a custom uh, style sheet, so you can, you know, in here we've got uh, all of the basic styles for the page put into the CK Editor style sheet, so uh, that um, brings the styles in so the user can see kind of better what they're doing and what it looks like um, on the page. Drupal 8 will fix a lot of that with inline editing, hopefully, maybe. Possibly, uh, but for now, that you know, it's basically bringing, giving the user as close to a, you know, a actually WYSIWYG experience because WYSIWYG editors are, are very, very often not WYSIWYG. You know, you you see something close to what you might get, but uh, it's not always the same. So. Uh, so I'm seeing a little bit more than that what most users would see, but uh, you know you can you can see it's basically it's a it's it's Drupal um, with some really basic straightforward settings that uh, that really really help kind of getting away from the webmaster thing. Um, we've got you know, my office manages probably a dozen sites in here, um, and we've kind of like humanity split. Are people that need just custom, you know, or just like that, that really just need content, we put them in here and say, go for it, do your thing, we'll help you kind of manage your architecture and we'll train you on it, um, but we don't want to spend any time developing a site for them. Uh, whereas on the other side, we have applications and other sites that we need to actually spend time developing. So by offloading, you know, I used to have 30 Drupal 6 sites, half of which or three quarters of which were just like, a bunch of basic pages. Um, so now I don't have to run those uh, those sites that were custom that weren't really custom for any reason. I don't know. I mean, they have to do custom sites. What kind of modules are they asking for that you don't have an outstanding? Right. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard. Um, I mean, we we do a lot of kind of talking with our, our users first about uh, um, the, the users being offices, departments. You know, basically anybody who our dean says you need to do something for these guys. Um, so uh, yeah, um, so uh, custom sites. I mean, basically anything that's 
that's really high profile, um, we do something custom for. So, um, you know, this is our biggest site. Uh, that's the kind of main college site. It's got a, a lot of different features, um, different content types that, uh, that we have built out, and it's a really kind of custom theme. Um, like but polls or forums or things like that might make it for the standard, but mm -hmm. we do it custom. Most of what we're doing is uh, is more like application based stuff. Um, so if we need to have kind of more workflows or more um, access permissions um, or kind of really custom uh, content, uh, yeah. Another one is the. So, oh, no, that, um, so this is a uh, kind of film, the film study center on campus. Um, it's a custom site that we did. One, because they're kind of off on the side and needed a really custom theme, but they also have, uh, you know, a whole set of, uh, of events that they kind of wanted to catalog. We're redoing the site right now with Omega. Does anybody use Omega 4? It's pretty awesome. It takes like a week to figure out what you're doing. Uh, context also is really cool. Uh, so this site, you know, it has a, a ton of custom content. Um, in general, you know, I found most people either say, "I want to put some text up," or they they have some a, a pretty good idea of what they want to do, and, and that's kind of the the line that we draw. Any other questions? Uh, I'll try and come up with a, a set of modules that we use for uh, for the site's uh, stuff. Uh, if you want any other, uh, if you want me to demo stuff more, I'm happy to uh, just come find me later. Uh, there's lots of stuff. It's fun. Uh, I've got cards. Oh, also, don't leave yet. I've got a book to give away. Design and prototyping for Drupal. It's an O'Reilly book. It's fun. Uh, this is a fun piece of Drupal trivia that I learned a long time ago. So does anybody know what Dr what Dries' birthday is and why it's significant in Drupal, apart from being his birthday? I saw your hand up first, I think. That's, I think that's right. There you go. That's exactly right. It's uh, one of the ways you can tell uh, a Drupal site is by looking at the, the expires tag on 99.9% .9 of Drupal sites. It's Dries' birthday. Um, so there you go. Come grab the book. Um, thanks, guys. Thank you. Yep. So this is me. Uh, Michael is the guy who runs the Sites at UChicago thing, and Peter is the guy from Humanities that helped with this. Um, feel free to get in touch with us however you like. <laughs>